Well, hey, I'm Beth Riley, and this is the Artist Spotlight Podcast Series, and today I have the pleasure of speaking to Jim Suler. Jim, how are you? Hey, Beth, it's so good to talk to you. I'm doing great. Thank you. Yeah, now we'll talk about the new album from Texas Scratch, the self-titled album, in just a bit. But first, let me start out with how you met the other two guitarists on the album, Vince Converse and Buddy Whittington. All three of us grew up in Texas. Uh, I'm in Dallas. Buddy was in Fort Worth, which is like 35 miles west of Dallas. Vince is in Houston. It's further away. It's probably like 235 miles from Dallas. So I had known these guys and had played with Buddy a few times. But I already knew Vince and and Buddy. And uh, back in 2009, a guy named Arnie Goodman from New York City, who at one time was a record label owner and he owned a record shop at another time and was a music photographer. He had his, uh, he had a lot of irons in the fire. He, he came up with this idea that we should do an album together. So he came up with a backer and I think they had a home for the record. So we convened in New Jersey to do this record back in 2009 and we recorded all the tracks in about five days. But then at some point the label situation fell apart or, withdrew or i'm not entirely sure what happened so consequently the record was shelved for a while and was shopped sporadically over the years and you know one thing led to another and while before you know it it had been 10 years and then finally 14 years before the record saw the light of day which is an unusual marketing strategy it unfolded like that which is uh it's not like like a conventional project as you as you can hear yeah as I said, we'll dig more into that in just a bit. You have your own band, Jim Suler and Monkey Beat. You've also played guitar alongside one of my favorites, George Thorogood, as a part of the Destroyers. And you've been with him since 99. 25 uh, but, years. Yeah, 25 years. Not too shabby. So how did you get your start in music initially? I was just a kid that liked music. I liked sports and cars and girls and music, just, you know, typical stuff. I really loved playing football. And then by junior high, it was apparent I wasn't going to be successful if I continued that. I just, I, you know, I wasn't good enough. I wasn't big enough. wasn't fast enough. So I picked up a guitar and was just playing it and going to concerts, you know, whatever I could go see. Growing up in Dallas, there was always lots of big shows coming through, so that that wasn't a problem. I mean, I could have been, you know, in some remote area, you know, not in the city and wouldn't be able to see all this stuff. So, you know, going to concerts in my mid-teens really showed me, you know, that, that maybe there was a path for me in music or there was a place for me. So one thing leads to another, and I'm just, you know, I took a few lessons, mainly learned by ear or off records or watching other guys, and just started playing the bar scene and, one thing led to another, and uh, I met George Thorogood in 1990 in Memphis at a bar called Huey's. And he dug what I was doing, and he hooked me up with his producer, Terry Manning, who was starting his own label. So I had a record, a CD out within a couple, you know, a year or two of meeting George. There, there was a period after I met George where I'd broken that group up that he heard when he met me, and formed a new band at, at that point then i reached out to his producer because he had told me man my producer terry manning would love you guys so somehow i found this guy and to my shock he he liked what we were doing and agreed to to work with us so it, once that record was out we started doing tours with george and i was going overseas and playing throughout the u.s and north america europe like with my band or opening for george and then by 1999, they had asked me to join the band. They were looking for a second guitar player. And I said, yeah, that would be a lot of fun. Let's do it. So I know you were a fan of George Thorogood, and I know you did cover songs of his, too. So what was it like to go from fan to being a part of his band? Well, I'm, I'm always a fan of, like, you know, if we, if we work with somebody that I love to listen to growing up i'm still i still keep really get past that part of it 
you know, where I'm on like an equal footing, so to speak. You know, it's hard for me to, to get that fan mentality out of my head. Yeah. The night I met George, uh, and he heard me play, we did a George Thorogood song in our set. I didn't even know he was in the room. I'm sure I wouldn't have done it if I had known that. It was great, you know. I mean, I'd gone out and opened for them, and so, I mean, I kind of knew the guys and, you know, knew what performing at that level would be, even though I wasn't on the bus. You know, you're an opening act, you're like a, kind of like a satellite hovering around the mothership. But I knew what the vibe was like, you know, what it, it, you're really stepping up to another level of business and performance. So, but, you know, playing in the bars is, you know, it, it, and watching all these great entertainers, it really showed me, you know, everything I needed to know to make that transition seamless or hopefully seamless. So as a guitar player and just a musician in general, who were or are some of your musical influences? There's so many. I think initially just for like a, a mindset would be the Beatles. I was born in 1960 and I had bought Beatles albums. And by the time I was in first grade, I remember taking them to show and tell in the first grade. You know, AM radio at that time in the mid 60s was a very powerful influence on me uh, there was a great station here in dallas called klif 1190 owned by a guy named gordon mcclendon who was one of the guys that founded that top 40 format so it was very influential on me i mean they would play everything from like the rolling stones to to jimmy reed to patula clark you know anything that was popular i heard it and I still have a very soft spot in my heart from top 40 music from that era. I still love, love, love to listen to it. As far as like playing guitar, once I started, uh, anything that was blues-based or rock-based, I liked the Rolling Stones and Led Zeppelin, all the usual suspects. And I like for guitar player, and you know, ZZ Top was huge growing up in Texas for me. And when I first started playing, bands like Leonard Skinner and the Allman Brothers, and Johnny Winter, Rory Gallagher, a little later, uh, the early ACDC stuff with Bon Scott. You know, I was going to punk shows, you know, later on, like saw the Ramones and Elvis Costello and a lot of those groups, like, you know, in their early years. I would go to all kinds of shows. So, I mean, I'm not any kind of purist by any stretch of the imagination. But, yeah, I mean, all those people influenced me as, as far as guitar playing. Robert Johnson, the great blues guitarist, like when I was really learning to play slide, you know, that's kind of my default stuff. If I, <laughs> I don't know what to play, I'll think what would Robert Johnson play and try to do something like that. Before we get into Texas Scratch, I have to talk about, and you kind of touched on it there a minute ago, but I have to talk about a member of the little old band from Texas, Billy F. Gibbons of ZZ Top. Mm -hmm. I know you've met him in... Actually, not too long ago, actually, I say not too long ago, a couple of years ago, my husband and I did a Zoom call with him. Both of us are massive fans of Billy in particular, but we we both like ZZ Top too. But as a guitar player and how good Billy is, what was it like meeting him? Yeah, I'm trying to think of the first time I actually spoke to him. It's I, I really can't even remember when that was. It's, it's like I've always known him, even though I... I didn't, you know, it's like meeting royalty to me. Like I, it's hard to overstate. Like if you're growing up playing guitar in Texas in the seventies as a teenager, how, what an enormous shadow those guys cast. I mean, I'm talking about the pre eliminator. They, this was before the car videos and the, and the beards, you know, the first four or five albums were very influential on me as far as just like the licks and themes the production values the tones it's made such a great influence on me that i mean i can't overstate it he was like a minister at my wedding in fact when i got married back in 2002 he ministered the wedding you know, we drove down to houston and, and we did it in houston and, and it was great you know the whole thing felt surreal like we went to my car and he had a cd of some like uh, stuff that he'd recorded for his recent album I think it would have been probably rhythming at that time. But he was playing it for me. We'd had some Mexican food, some cerveza. <laughs> and I just was, remember thinking to myself, is this really happening? Because it just, you know, it just, it's, it can't be happening. <laughs> uh, like I said, it's hard for me to get past that looking at somebody from those young eyes. Yeah. Right. But he's great. He's a huge influence on me, as I've said like five times. But. <laughs> He's a sweet guy. He's a gentleman. He's you know, he's got a wicked sense of humor. He's got a great 
vision for his group and the music and his brand. And I think he's brilliant. I, I love Billy F. Gibbons. We do, too. I promise. We're going to talk about Texas Scratch right now. You have a few writing credits on the album. One of them happens to be my favorite song on the entire album, I'd Rather Be Lucky Than Good. What was the inspiration or the motivation behind that one? Yeah, I generally write with a title. I begin with a title, like I have a phrase or a title, so I kind of know where I'm going. I don't just sit down and just start writing lyrics. I have to have a place to begin and to return for a, a chorus or a hook, so to speak. So I had that term. It, it's sort of a pseudo cliche, I guess. I'd rather be lucky than good. Um, so I was out on tour with George Thorogood, and we were doing pre-production for a George Thorogood album with Tom Hambridge, who was producing, and also we were writing with Tom. So that was one of the songs we wrote, possibly for George, but it didn't really fit George, so I took it. Actually, There was actually another song we wrote for George called Years of Tears that I ended up recording on my Tijuana Bible album that George didn't want to do because he said it was too dark. So I thought, wow, that's, I thought that I took that as a compliment. But yeah, that's how I met Tom. So we just sat out on the bus one day and, and wrote it. You know, writing with Tom is, is really easy. You know, we're the same age. We're only separated by, our birthdays are separated by 10 days. We're born the same year. And uh, we, we loved all the same music. It's like we, you know, we were like the same guy growing up, you know, a thousand miles apart. He was from Buffalo. He knew what I was going for. And I kind of understood what he was saying. Like when he had suggestions, his references made complete sense to me because of the mutual things we liked and grew up listening to. So, yeah, we recorded that. And then I, it didn't come out for many years. As I mentioned, I'd considered it doing it on another record. You know, like, that's not coming out. I should re-record it, release it. Back in, I guess, early summer last year, I read, you know, on social media that this new album is Texas Scratch is coming out. And I, you know, none of us knew about this until we read about it on the Internet. I won't be re-recording that song. I'll just let this version I really like it, and I love what, what Buddy Whittington and Vince did with the song. And I got to say that I, I really enjoyed working with our engineer, Ben Elliott, who owned the studio, Showplace Studios in Dover, New Jersey, and sadly he's passed away. But just a sweet guy, a gentleman, it really knew his way around the console, and, and you know it just makes it easy for the musician when you have somebody that has a gentle way about them, but they're they're going to let you know how it is, but you don't ever feel like you're being yelled at or, or hectored or bugged or anything. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, it does. A close second favorite on the album would be the Buddy Whittington written tune, Texas Trio. I just like that one. I think that one is a great way to start off the album, too. It kind of describes the three of you <laughs> as guitar players. But tell me about the non-guitar players in the group. You have drummer Jeff Simon and bassist Nathaniel Peterson. I was talking about Ben Elliott had passed also like last year. In fact, right after the album was released digitally, sadly, Nathaniel passed away. He was living in Italy. And I had never met Nathaniel before that session. And I never saw him after that session. I've only had five days with him. And he was very, just a very quiet, a big guy, a gentle giant would be a good way to describe him. Yeah. He very soft spoken, didn't hardly say anything. But yeah, I love what he played. And of course, Jeff Simon, I know from the Destroyers. Right. He knows his way around the studio. You know, everybody was seasoned and knew what to do in the studio because we'd all had been doing this extensively for years. That made it easy. You know, everybody knows the drill. They show up prepared and they're, you know, they're there to do their work. And Jeff's a great guy. He's a good friend. And those guys all have some great stories too. You know, especially Jeff, who the Destroyers, a lot of the bands they played with were some pretty cool bands. Now, on the entire album, do you have a song that you would tell somebody, this is the go-to track? Do you have a favorite one? I gave you two of mine already. It would be one of yours, which is Buddy Song, Texas Trios. As you said, it's sort of a mission statement. It sort of a, it kind of says what's going to happen or what's going on here. Buddy was just writing about Texas. It had a lot of great musical trios, You know, I guess starting with Buddy Holly and the Crickets. Of course, ZZ Top and Stevie Ray Vaughan in Double Trouble before Reese Winans joined. Uh, I think Los Lonely Boys is mentioned. He mentions uh, John Nitzinger's group and probably others, and I'm forgetting. 
that was Buddy's lyrical angle on that song. Buddy is, you know, a world-class guitar player, but he's a very talented lyricist as well. He, he writes very clever, original, and funny lyrics. You know, very, very compelling. So I think, yeah, Buddy's a very criminally underrated player. I mean, the people that are hip to Buddy are, like, way into it. But if you see him and hear him, he just plays such cool stuff. And it's, it's such a Fort Worth sound because it's, it's got a taste of country in it. But the rock and that nasty blues sound is definitely there. And I think that's a big difference between a lot of the guys in Fort Worth and Dallas. And we're only 35 miles apart is that country music element is more prevalent there than in Dallas. Yeah. Because Fort Worth was, was always a cow town. It was a, initially a fort to repel Comanche Indian attacks back in the you know, 1850s, I believe, and um, it's grown into a bustling metropolis. But, but yeah, Buddy's fantastic, and he's just such a talented all-around artist. Now, which city in Texas that you've been to? I'm sure you haven't been to all of them, but oh, no. <laughs> but which city that you have been to in Texas has the best barbecue? You have to ask a barbecue question to a Texan, right? <laughs> I guess probably anything down in the Austin area and the outlying areas. It's kind of what everybody says, and I'm not going to disagree with that. But yeah, I mean, I haven't been to Austin and eaten barbecue in a long time, but I need to go down. I know there's so many good places. I mean, where you like get in line and before they open and you wait and then they open and when they run out, they close. So, I mean, they may be open for a couple of hours. I'm from Alabama originally, and okay. they don't do barbecue the same as Texas, but I think they could give Texas a run for their money. <laughs> and everything's, you know, pork based there, I'm guessing. Probably, you know? yeah. More beef in Texas. Uh, although if you get in East Texas, you'll probably run into more pork there. Like East Texas is like you're in the deep south. Yeah. Like if I go an hour east of Dallas, I'm in the Piney Woods. I mean, which is East Texas. If I go an hour west, it's like cowboy country. So. <laughs> Dallas is, is right on that cusp. Like, we're basically anything west of I-35, this cowboy kind. It's really simplifying it, oversimplifying it. But Will Rogers used to have a saying that Fort Worth is where the west begins and Dallas is where the east peters out. And while that's funny, it's not entirely true. It's it, it's more like where the, the deep south ends. But that's part of what makes Texas what it is, is that this, this convergence of these different things, Mexican culture and food and music and the blues and hip hop and country music and rock and roll and jazz. A lot, there were a lot of, you know, great horn based blues and jazz bands uh, out of Texas, you know, in, in the post World War II era. But yeah, it's a good place to grow up and learn how to play. Now, a while back, I interviewed Greg Martin, who's another fabulous guitar player of the Kentucky okay. Headhunters. <laughs> I love uh, Greg. Oh, yeah, Greg. How could you not? <laughs> He's a very good friend of ours. But I'm going to ask you a similar question that I asked him. The Kentucky Headhunters have their massive hit, Dumas Walker, where they talk about a slaw burger fries and a bottle of ski. Mm -hmm. I asked Greg to pick one of those three. He chose ski, of course, because why not? It's a Kentucky thing. Backtracking some, going back to... George Thorogood, you know where I'm going with this, don't you? I have a guess. <laughs> I know you've been asked this one before, but would you pick one bourbon, one scotch, or one beer? Well, I don't like scotch. Me either. And I do like bourbon, but I drink hard liquor so rarely anymore. But I, I do like beer, and I'm such a lightweight. I mean, I'll drink two beers, and, you know, then I'm, well, look out. You know, I, I just, I, I don't. I can't. I can't process uh, alcohol well anymore. I guess what happens, you know, when I get to my geriatric years. No, oh, jeez. <laughs> I drink a couple of beers and I'm good. You know, I, I'd probably rather smoke weed than do any of those. But <laughs> there, there, I've said it. It's oh, out. You, so yeah, George could change it to one bourbon, yeah. one scotch, one beer, or one hit. <laughs> one, one, one bourbon, one scotch, and one bong hit. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay kids don't try this at home yeah <laughs> one thing i like to do in every interview i ever have done is i have to mention a name and he's not known for being a, a guitar shredder 
but he's somebody that I like talking about. He's one of my favorite artists, Jackson Brown. Are you a fan of Jackson Brown? Yes. In fact, the song These Days, you know that song? Yeah, Nico did it originally. Which I read that it was the first song he ever wrote. At like 14. (laughs) Yeah, but that blew my mind because I came across a version of that song a couple years ago on YouTube. And I've heard different versions. I've heard Greg Allman do it. I didn't know Nico had done it. I get it. It would work for Nico. Uh, But there was this one particular version. I'm not even sure I can find it anymore. That I went, that's like one of the heaviest things I ever heard. <laughs> it's like it made me cry. It was so, you know, it, was, it touched me so much. I love Jackson Brown probably more now than I ever did. I, it's not that I didn't like him before. I liked it. I just was like into other things. I did a show, a couple of shows with David Lindley, and that was, you know, an eye and ear opener. I never asked him about any of that, but uh, he, he played on that like, running on empty stuff, that iconic slide guitar. Yeah. That big Jackson Brown in his cold catalog. Now, you'll go back to John and be like, that chick talked about Jackson Brown. She talked about the Kentucky Headhunter. She talked about... <laughs> That's good, because I get tired. You know, I, I really, the whole shredder, like anybody that just is strictly a shredder, I'm, I get bored with that like two seconds. I, I want a song, not a speed bump waiting for a guitar solo. Yeah. You know? Well, Jackson Brown and James Taylor are two my dad constantly had on. It seemed like repeat, but I'm okay with the Jackson Brown part. And James Taylor, I'm a still a massive fan of, but... Yeah, I think Taylor, too. Yeah. They know how to play guitar. They're just not shredders. <laughs> That's the thing with blues. Initially, blues was a vocal-driven genre. And then at some point in the 60s, it became a guitar solo, like a platform for hot solos, which was probably more of a necessity because... It was mainly a bunch of white kids that were playing it back then, and none of them could sing like a black man. Yeah. Like, like very few, you know, come close. So I think that was a necessity. I like a great guitar player, but, you know, it, it, it's got to be in service of the song. Yeah. One question that I like to ask it has to do with the time machine. So if you could travel back in time to a day that's, you know, not today and before you talk to me and had to deal with this craziness, um, if you could pick a time to go back and you know visit like the 60s or 70s or yesterday or last week is there a time that you'd want to travel back to is this for music or i mean you know because i could get into like fan like late family members but I, I, you know i don't i'd rather just keep it on music so i'll just say that yeah that's fine in part of the 20s and 30s when guys like bonham and jefferson or charlie Patton and were applying their trade maybe before they'd recorded just to see what that all that sounded like i think if i could go back in time for any one event musically it would be like for charlie Patton's first recording session yeah just to sit in a room and like and be in a room with that with it instead of like hearing it recorded i, I just think that would be very powerful to me it would really resonate with me because i'm a big 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 fan of the Mississippi blues singer Charlie Patton, who's, who died in 1934. So, you know, we're talking what, 90 years ago. Yeah. If you had an opportunity to jam out with him, is there a Charlie Patton song that you'd want to jam out with him to? I, I wouldn't dare jam out with him. I'd just, I would just sit and watch and listen. Talking about jamming with people, I, there, I could say any, I mean, there's a thousand things I could say, and I can't think of one right now. One where I'm like painting myself into a corner with, you know? Yeah. <laughs> if I had to play something with Charlie Patton, I would just say the song Pony Blues. Okay. Now, another fun question that I like to ask, if you could pick three to five albums to take with you to a desert island, which three to five albums would you pick? This for a rock and roll album, I like Exile on Main Street by the Rolling Stones. Something classical, because I like classical music, so maybe like box string quartets. And I don't know, I'll probably regret this one, only because it'll be something else will be left out. I've got this uh, anthology called Archology, and it's by Lee Scratch Perry, the Jamaican producer. Okay. I really like that a lot. It's like four CDs. But that, I guess that's one artist. So if it's three, and a jazz artist, maybe like something by uh, Louis Armstrong. Uh, probably the complete recordings of his Hot Fives and Hot Sevens. Yeah. Probably like the 
the Hank Williams anthology, and I'll just say something by uh, the uh, recorded works of, of Ray Charles, too. Yeah, I can't stop at five, but Louis Armstrong was, to me, the greatest American musician of the 20th century. Just in terms of his influence and, and, and just how great he still is to me, and if you read his memoirs, they're fascinating, or any biography on him is fascinating. He was quite a man. What an inspiring story in person. Now, I'll call you again tomorrow and find out if you have a new favorites. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm just kidding. Okay, so I know Texas Scratch just came out, but it was also recorded in 2009. So is there is there new stuff coming up for Texas Scratch or even George Thorogood and the Destroyers or Jim Suler well, and Monkey Beat? <laughs> as far as recordings? Yeah, just anything, uh, touring or anything like that. Uh, well, I'm, the George Thorogood stuff is going to wind uh, kick off in mid-April, so I've got some downtime. I'm doing some occasional shows around the area here, and actually some of those are with Buddy as Texas Scratch. Now, the, like it's really difficult for us, ge you know, geographically. Vince Converse lives in Denver, and Jeff Simon lives in Philadelphia, and Buddy and I are here in North Texas. So, so we're working and doing something to promote the record. We're playing just a few gigs locally at this time, but we're looking at uh, doing some more stuff out of town, maybe with the other guys, some festival shows, some higher paying stuff where it makes sense financially to bring them in. Yeah. But I'm kind of waiting for some of these George Thorogood tour windows to solidify before I lock anything down. So, uh, but it'll be a busy year. And I have a recording, a single I did with Tyler Bryant. If you're familiar with Tyler Bryant, the shakedown, do you, are you familiar with those guys? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tyler's great. Um, he's living in Nashville. I've known him for probably 20 years. I went to Nashville late last year and uh, recorded this song he and I had written together. He's got his lovely wife, Rebecca, from Larkin Poe, singing background on it. And it's called Dusty Groove, and we're going to release that soon and perhaps follow it up with some more recordings with Tyler and perhaps a 7-inch uh, vinyl release to go along with that. And I, I had a single come out about a year ago called Get Your Head Right, a Jim Sewer and Monkey Beat song, and probably include that on the vinyl release. But yeah, and I'm always writing and you know getting stuff ready. So um, I'm considering doing a, just a more like an instrumental album. It would be more of a Sunday morning album instead of a Saturday night album. Got you. So you're not staying busy or anything. So you got that going for you. <laughs> it used to be a lot easier for, to transition from one project to the other. When I was younger, it takes a little more adjustment these days. I love having all these different things to do. It keeps, keeps me engaged and excited and involved in the music and yes, yeah, I, I still get joy from the music, you know? And so that, that part's all good. I still feel the same charge I did when I was 18 doing it. Well, that's good. Yeah. So for you, if there is somebody that hasn't heard the name Jim Suler, where could they go to find out more information about you? Do you have like uh, a website, social media, all that fun stuff? Oh, yeah. I would direct them to my website. It's jimsuler.com, J-I-M-S-U-H-L-E-R.com. I'm on your usual social media platforms like Instagram and Facebook. You know, as far as the album goes, Corto Valley Records has a website. You can order the album. Uh, also, it's available on Amazon. Any digital music platforms, you can download it or you can you can stream it if you like on Spotify or iTunes or wherever. You know, it's all available out there. I would urge everybody to check it out. Very cool. Well, Jim, I want to thank you so much for taking the time out to chat with me today. It has been an absolute pleasure. Texas Scratch, not a bad song on it. I just, like I said, I do have my, my two favorites from it, but from start to finish, it is a fantastic album, as is pretty much every album that I've heard that you are a part of. Congrats on all of your accomplishments there. Thanks, Beth. You're prepared and you do a good job and you're you're pleasant to talk to and I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Well thank, thank you, Beth. you. I appreciate that, Jim. Thank you, Beth. Pleasure was mine.